Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, it's Adam, the Chief Operations Officer of the Hama Association. It is really, really hot today. So I decided I would finish off my section of the Learn Historical African Martial Arts program wearing some uh, traditional uh, North African clothes. Uh, it is 40 degrees today, also known as Bake a Man Alive. So uh, I'm going to start sharing this to the main uh, Hama group. And uh, then we'll talk, we'll wait for a few people to sign in and then we'll get the class started. Okay, we got that. And we got that. All right, so look at that. We got two people in already. How are you doing, everybody? Um, beautiful day. Hope everybody is uh, surviving quarantine. It is, uh, it's been a really interesting couple of months, uh, but I'm glad that we were able to get this going and uh, share it with all of you. Uh, on Saturday, of course, uh, Damon Stith will be beginning his program at uh, uh, noon central time. Uh, he'll be starting with Capoeira Short Blades. Uh, for uh, his round of the Learn Historical African Martial Arts Workshop. But today, we're talking about swords. So, uh, one of the first things they want to touch on today is sources. Um, we get a lot of questions about what our sources are, where we get them, what kind of information are we using to build our systems, uh, how do we do it? So, one of the first, shall we say, myths about uh, African martial arts or historical African martial arts is that there are no written texts, um, or that the martial arts themselves aren't formalized, which isn't, it's not true. I mean, you do have a lot of informal systems that have uh, sort of a general down the lineage way of teaching. You have some systems that are very strict, uh, very structured, and have a, a very tight system that uh, uh, sort of underpins how the pedagogy works, or they have a well-developed pedagogy, I should say. Um, in North Africa, we do have quite a bit of that. so. Uh, for example, uh, one of the sources that we're working from right now is from the Mamluk Project. Um, it is uh, written by Bin Khazam. Um, it is, uh, we're calling it uh, Bin Khazam's Art of the Fursiya. Uh, we'll have an update for that later on this week, but uh, one of the exercises that we'll be teaching today um, comes from a text similar to that, or I believe it comes from that text, I cannot remember, but we had this translated about a year or so ago. Um, so I'll be teaching the exercise, the Mamluk exercise, Threading the Needle. Um, Another one of the sources that we use is the uh, several living traditions. So we have, for example, a matrek, which is a wealth of knowledge where uh, historical African martial traditions are concerned. Uh, for most of our North and uh, Sudanic sword systems, this is the foundation. Um, El Matreg, um, if you remember from last week's class, we really don't know how old it is, but we know it's been around for a very long time, uh, that there are three forms uh, that, that, that basically form the foundation for single sword, double sword, and then uh, two-handed weapons. Uh, that could be axes, it could be uh, cudgels, um, any type of weapon along those lines. Um, so those are the two major sources. Uh, we lean very heavily on El Matreg because it uh, has the body mechanics, the foot positions, and the hand positions that can easily transition into using these North African weapons. Uh, we also have um, Razmafsar. So uh, Razmafsar is from the Persian side, so that is the uh, Persian martial arts community. Uh, they've been very gracious with sharing a lot of their practical knowledge. Uh, now, Persia has had a lot of influence in, Af in the Middle East and in North Africa in terms of weapon, tactics, armor, um, all kinds of things. There was, of course, a back and forth flow, you know, when you have different civilizations that interact with each other often, you're going to see a lot of exchange. So there definitely is uh, a lot where that's concerned. Uh, so they've been great in terms of uh, a lot of their videos and, uh, and the team has been really good with uh, sharing with us some of the things that they have learned using a very similar weapon set. Uh, now the approaches between North Africa and Persia are a little bit different. Um, Africa in North Africa, at least, uh, you find a little bit more fluid movement, uh, a lot more reliance on footwork, um, and the idea is that this is sort of geared a lot more towards lightly armored or unarmored fighting, whereas in uh, Persia, you see a lot of very heavily armored guys, especially uh, in the Rasmussar group, um, so their movements will be a little bit different from ours, or their approaches will be a little bit different from ours. 
but we've definitely been able to learn a lot from them. So shout out to the Rasmussar team. Uh, you guys are phenomenal. Um, so that, those are basically our three major categories of sources. We have written sources that we've been able to translate into languages that we can read. Um, there's also, of course, um, the Memlick Lancer, uh, translated by Kirsty Jensen, which has been very good for uh, learning... <laughs> Excuse me. Allergies, uh, which has been very good for learning um, martial principles. Um, for example, the goal is to get past the opponent's point, uh, which you also see in modern Tartib. Um, uh, in terms of the fourth principle, which is getting past the opponent's weapon. If you're here for classes one and two, uh, then you would have uh, received that, uh, that lesson. Um, so that's one thing. So another thing we want to talk about is swords. So um, North Africa has a dynamic range of swords. Most people associate uh, the, so the sword called the scimitar with uh, North Africa in the Middle East, which doesn't actually exist. Scimitars do not exist. Um, it is a European mispronunciation of the word shamshir, which is Persian, which just means sword. Um, there are different types of swords that are used in North Africa throughout history. Um, you can go through in Egypt, they had you know, the Kopesh, but if you want to get a bit more medieval, um, they had um, North Africa for a long time was part of the Roman Empire, and uh, especially the eastern or the western part of North Africa was part of the Byzantine Empire for a very long time until the uh, Islamic expansion. So uh, the the Byzantines or the Eastern Romans had a lot of influence on the weapons and tactics that they would have used. Uh, you see this referenced in Kirsty Jensen's The Mammoth Lancer uh, with moves like the Syrian block, which is directly attributed to the Romans or the Eastern Romans, Byzantines, however you want to call them. Um, so if we want to talk about swords, um, the misconception that is often spread is that all of the swords were curved, which is not true. For most of their history, they used swords similar to this. So this is a, a Tacoba or a training Tacoba made by Street Forge Armory. Um, this, of course, is, was the general shape. Some of them had a little bit less of a guard on them. Um, one of the more common swords that you see from the early Mamluk era is called the Sword of the Prophet, uh, which is a sword that is meant to mimic the types of swords carried by the early Arab armies. And they generally carried swords similar to this. Uh, you see Tacobas also used across the Sahara, mostly in West Africa. But this is the general cross guard, straight blade, tapered point, pommel, that was the sword that carried for quite some time. Um, later on, you have more influence from the, uh, from the Persians. So that's where you get shapes like this. So this is where swords like the Shamshir come in. Uh, this, of course, is a sword that nobody really knows exactly where the sabers came from. But we know that they come from somewhere in Eurasia and that they spread, uh, at least these particular group of sabers um, started in... Eurasia somewhere and spread through the Middle East, uh, through the Turks, through the Mongols, um, the Avars, and what have you. So Shamshirs are also a, a weapon that you see. Um, you see a sword similar to this um, carried by the U.S. Marine Corps, which is called uh, the Mamluk Sword, which was gifted to uh, the Marines during the uh, Barbary Wars for uh, some for their bravery. It's a really interesting story. If I remembered all of the names, I would tell you, but I'll probably add that in the comments later. Uh, but the Marines do carry a sword that is similar to a Shamshir. Shamshirs also uh, were very popular with a lot of European armies as part of the dress uniform. Um, so you do see a lot of people in the 19th century carry swords that look very much like Shamshirs. Um, then, of course, we have the arrival of the Turks. And with the Turks, you get weapons kind of like the Killage. So this particular uh, design, also made by Street Forge Armory, especially for me, thanks to Mon, um, is based on a weapon similar to the Turkish Killage or Karala. You'll notice that the curve is not as pronounced in this weapon. Uh, but you'll note the, the typical J-hilt, the cross guard, and this is the general shape that you're looking at. Um, Later on, of course, uh, you find uh, during the Barbary Wars in the, uh, or, you know, the heyday of the Barbary pirates in the 18th and 19th century, uh, you'll see weapons kind of like this. Uh, this is my training flissa, also made by Street Forge. Um, and you'll notice that there's an absence of a guard. I do not quite remember why they do not put guards on these, but uh, this is a sword that was carried by uh, Barbary pirates. So uh, as you can see, there is a wide cross-section of swords that they would have carried. 
Um, it's of course important to note that uh, they're different for different eras, but generally the swords past a certain point uh, didn't really change. Um, now we'll talk about shields. So another misconception is that um, Arabs all carried round shields, or North Africans, uh, Berbers all carried round shields, which they did, which definitely was, but um, there was more variety. Um, so for example, uh, here's an example of uh, an Ayyubid um, kite shield. Let me just get up and I'll show you the full size here. So this is my example of an Ayyubid kite shield. Um, you'll notice uh, a little slight difference from what you'd see in the Europeans, and at the top is a bit rounder. It's a bit shorter and a little bit fatter. Um, so this is generally the design that would have been carried in the Middle Ages, heavily influenced, of course, uh, by their interaction with the Crusaders and the Byzantines, but definitely a very North African style to the shield shape. Um, the grip on these particular shields that I made out of cardboard and duct tape um, are not exactly representative, but that's generally a functional issue. But uh, you'll see on this end here that uh, you actually kind of carry it almost like your, uh, your you're, you're keeping your fist up here. And you'll see this uh, later on in, in today's class when we talk about motions. Uh, next, of course, we have um, something you guys see me with often. Um, this is based on a design called a gashan, uh, but it could also be representative of a sapar. This was a shield type that was carried um, in Ethiopia, Sudan, so that's a bit more East Africa, but similar styles like this were carried uh, in North Africa, generally made of steel, um, but they could also be made of rhino hide. Um, the other side of these shields, um, this obviously again is not representative on the inside grip, but they would have straps and a pad in the middle. Now that's important because uh, these would allow you to hold on to your reins and give you a bit more leeway in terms of how you could hold it or hold the shield. Um, it also gives you the freedom to hold another weapon without having to wrap around a giant you know, hand grip like you would see in a lot of European bucklers. So you would have combinations similar to this. Um, so that's another example. Um, they also carry shields that were similar to the doll that you see in India. Um, you see some examples uh, where they have the four points in there and those are actually interesting um, because we're having some, there are some discussions about whether or not that was particularly just a design for keeping the straps in place or if it was also used to prevent sliding of swords. I am not an expert in that particular area, so I will leave that up to people who know more than I do. So the final design uh, that we're talking about for shields is the Adarga or Adaraka. Um, so this is a bit oversized, but this is sort of the heart-shaped shield that you often see carried by Moors and by Spaniards actually during, the, uh, during their conquest of the Americas. Um, these, were gen these were originally designed in, I believe it was Fez, Morocco, and uh, they were quite popular with, uh, with the Moors and eventually the Spanish. And uh, they were, the straps on the inside, of course, had uh, straps to be held in this way. Again, this is not perfectly representative, but you can see that you're able to hold it in this fashion, or you can also strap it on your arm. Either or, it was ideally for uh, riding on horseback. You see some images from uh, medieval Spain showing uh, Moors carrying their shields in that way. So those are the different types of shields that you would see. Uh, in this particular class, uh, we're going to go with the one that I use all the time, so that is this Gashen type design. It will also give you the opportunity to see more of my body as I do the exercises. The sword I'm also going to select for today is going to be my favorite sword, which is the Mamluk Saber. So, um, let's begin. So, uh, first we're going to do, before we get into using the weapons at all, uh, we do need to make sure that we are limbered up. I don't want anybody pulling anything or being strained. Um, so we'll just start with getting a little bit loose, then we'll pick up the weapons and we'll have some fun, okay? And here we go. This way. Now this is going to use a lot of your upper body, so you want to make sure that you are loose, especially around the neck and shoulders. Good. Look to your right, look to your left, look up, look down, good. Now we're going to roll our shoulders, just like this. Shrink it. 
and back the other way. Good, 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 good. All right, now we're gonna roll the shoulders back. And forward. Take your right arm, put it across your chest, grab your elbow and press it in. You want to feel that stretch in your shoulder. Good. And you do the same thing with your left, across your chest, grab the elbow, pull it in. Good. Good. Now take your hands, put them behind your back. You want to do kind of a cable grip or interlock your fingers. And stretch your hands up. Two, three, four, five, Good. Now, take your right hand, put it behind your head like this, and press your elbow down. Hands up, and back again. Two. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. All right. Now you want to turn your waist to come to your left. Your right. Your left. Your right. Your left. Your right. Your left. Your right. Your right. Good. All right. Now we'll loosen up the hips. Good. Good, good, good. All right, now take your right foot, grab the heel, or grab the ankle, sorry, bring it in. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Put your leg out. Take your left leg, grab your ankle, bring it in. You should feel the stretch right in the front of your hammy there, or your quads. Five, six, seven, eight, and ten. Good, good, good. All right. Now, let's do the swords. So, all right. So, First, let's talk a little bit about the grips. Now, if you remember in uh, the class from last week when we did uh, Elma Treg, you had the three grips, one, two, and three. Now, obviously, you can't do the thumb grip with a cross guard. So you really have just two grips. You have the full hammer grip, and you have the pistol grip. Now, edge alignment, if you remember from last week, I talked about it being led by these knuckles here. If you notice, when I'm holding the sword, these are the knuckles that are leading the sword and are in line with the blade. Or the blade, because this is not a real sword. Okay? So that's the first thing. Holding the sword, you can either hold it this way or this way. It really depends on what position your hand is in at any given time. And uh, in terms of placement of the thumb, um, so you have your thumb. You can put your thumb here when you're doing the pistol grip, or you can put it here. You can grip it and sort of put it just under the guard here to stabilize it a little bit. When you have a, the actual sword, you'll have a little bit more weight on the sides here. There'll be, it'll obviously be a bit wider, so that will help with keeping it from wobbling from side to side. And we'll talk about the shield. So the general placement of the shield, and uh, you see this in a different, uh, there are different ways to hold the shield, but the general standard in terms of when you're starting out, you have two ways to do it. You can put your left foot forward so your shield leg goes first. If you didn't have a shield, it would be your sword leg. But your shield leg will go first. You take your shield here, hold it in the fist, and you want to hold it here. So you're looking at guarding your chin, guarding your face. Now the roll of the shield isn't just to cover and block. You're also looking at using it dynamically. So 
uh, you will sometimes knock things out of the way, you will press things down, you will use it to push your opponent's arm down so that you can pin them. So there are various ways to apply it in that way. Uh, you also use it when your arm is in a vulnerable position. So for example, if you're here and you want to do a cut, you don't leave your elbow out to get sliced, you put your buckle up. If your sword is up here, your, your uh, shield is a bit lower. If your sword is down here, if your sword is down here, your shield should be up. If you're down, your shield is up. If you're up, your shield is down. If your sword is up. So it depends on, it's always in relation to where you put your sword. But that gets a bit more complicated as you go into various combinations, and we're not doing any of that today. So the first basic position is here. The second basic position is here. And this is good for what we call the defensive cone. Uh, because it creates sort of an area where the sword, if it's caught here, can't get past. But we also have to remember that, if you remember from the cuts from last week, you do have cuts like the lachia, which can cut up under the shield. So do always be cautious when you're leaving your arm out, because that is that can be an invitation to get cut under. So, what do you do with the sword? Now, there are various guard positions that you can use in this particular style, but uh, for the purposes of this class, we're just going to go with two basic positions. The first is this. So you see this in a lot of the manuscripts, a lot of the images, um, everything in, from Ethiopia to Egypt to North to uh, the Maghreb, and even in some Moorish art, you see a lot of this or a lot of this. We also have, for today's uh, lesson, we have this, this position here, or this position here. So this is generally uh, your catch-all for striking from all your different, from all your different angles. Uh, this here generally is specified for cutting or to do sort of an over-the-shield thrust. Um, so for today, uh, again, we're going to focus on a particular exercise. And that particular exercise uh, will be the uh, threading the needle. So first, uh, before we get into threading the needle, we've gone through how to hold the shield, how to hold the, how to hold the sword. Now let's talk about striking mechanics. So when you are striking, you want to draw. You don't, you're not looking to hack. You want to let the weapon do the work for you. Okay. So what you're trying to do is draw the whole blade across. You're trying to get as much blade onto your target as you can. You're also looking to hit with what's called the point of percussion. The point of percussion is about three quarters of the blade. Here you can see it's where the curve is at its steepest. So that is um, so that is generally where you want to where you want to lay the blade on, and then you're dragging the rest of the blade across that particular point that you hit. So you know you get that strike and you pull. And this is also to help to keep the blade from getting away from you. And you'll see those mechanics in the exercise that we'll be doing. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about thrusting. You absolutely can thrust with a curved blade. Uh, the angles are a little bit different than what you would expect with a straighter blade. Mind you, something like this, you can absolutely str thrust straight on. Absolutely. Uh, but that also you also have room to come under in this way, like you're doing a hook. You can stab in this way. Uh, you can also step up and under. So you do get more angles with this particular blade style. So let's get into the exercise. So we're going to do an exercise today that is called threading the needle. Um, you've seen various members of the Hammer Council do this exercise with weapons from uh, sabers to kobas to kopeshes to you name it. Uh, it's a really great exercise for practicing mechanics and also targeting. Uh, threading the Needle is a mammoth exercise that was uh, translated by uh, one of our colleagues in the Hammer Group, uh, Shouts out Shadow and Mer, uh, and I believe it comes from the treasure that encompasses all arts, but I have to verify the name of the source for that, but we actually do have the image and the translation written out. Um, this particular exercise uh, does, I believe it is 12 cuts to the head, um, and this is a horseman's exercise. So the general idea is that you know, you're, on, you're on your horse and you need to meet with somebody and you are cutting as you can as you pass by, whether you're on your horse or your camel or whatever you're riding. So 
Uh, let's get started with that exercise. Now, normally, when you're doing your basic, when you're doing your basic defense, you are here, you are here, it's your left leg forward. The difference with this one is, and you'll see why in a minute, your shield leg is actually back. This is a slightly more aggressive style. You take your shield and you still put it here, at, around your chin area. You will take your sword and you will put it here. So you can either put it like this or you can put it like this. It depends on what you feel more comfortable doing. If the exercise says this way, personally, I prefer this guard because uh, if you do a lachia cut, your shield is already, your sword is already brought to rest here, and less this way. But this is absolutely a thing that you can do. So you take your right foot, make sure that your and then back bit here so you can see my feet. Your right foot is pointed towards your opponent. Your left foot should be at about a 45 degree angle. You want to be about even in the, your weight distribution. You don't want to lean too heavily on your right, on your lead foot. And the reason for that is because if somebody cuts at your lead foot, you want to be able to slip it. You don't want to put too much weight on it. But you also want to be able to lean into the attack. So you're going to be more or less even throughout this particular exercise. So you'll take your shield and you'll put it here. Take your sword and you'll put it here. So you should look something like this. So this is what you should look like in that position. And you can also do it this way. I'll turn this way. Okay. So the first cut is going to be a draw across the eyes. Now if you remember in the last class, you're aiming for here. And as you can see, I'm wearing a turban today. So the cut should come here. This is where you're aiming. Because if you cut up here, you know, you're gonna hit him, it's gonna hurt, but it's not gonna cut anything because you have turban in, the, in, in that space. And especially if the turbans are especially thick, this one isn't, but if they're a bit thicker and uh, you know, they're made of a tougher fabric or they're made of silk, uh, you're not gonna slice through it. I mean, it'll hurt, but you're not gonna kill anybody with it. At least you might, if maybe, but anyway. So the first cut, come across the eyes. So bring the foot over, just like that. So the cut comes this way. If you're holding it from this position, and you want to make sure to turn your hips into the cut. You're not using your arm, you're using your back and your hips. Your arm only hits the direction of the blade. The rest of your body is what gives it the power. So the first cut, that's one. Now you recoil, so you want to bring it back to cover your head. Because again, if you're not wearing a helmet, and it's hot like today, you don't want to cook your brain, you want to make sure you're giving that a little bit of added insurance. A turban is protection, but it's not a helmet. So your next cut, from here, straight down on top of the head. So you go from here, one, two. Shoot from this side, one, Two. One, two. Now, so you go from one to two. Recoil again, because remember, you're covering your head. Three. And you notice that when I'm doing the turn, I'm turning my body. And if you notice the position of the shield, two, so for three, three, there. So you're covering, you're making sure to cover the side of your body that is vulnerable because you could take a cut to your leg and still fight. But if they cut your arm, you can't hold your sword. So again, from the beginning, one, two, three. So now you're here. Next, you want to do another cut. So you have four, five. So this is a double, four, five. So we'll start again. One, two, three, four, five, okay? So now, so now we've done five. Six, so now you're cutting with the top of the head again. So 
six. So you come from here, you're going to one, or your four, and five, six. Now this is a full follow through. So you'll go again. One, two, three, four, five, six. And now if you remember when I said that you want to take your leg and your shield leg is actually going to be back. This is why. Because you're doing a follow through with the cut. If your leg is here and you try to do that cut, I mean you could do it, but now your body is a little bit more up. It's a lot smoother when you cut through here. Okay? Now you do your next cut. This is what we call a lechia, which is a rising cut. So we'll move again from the beginning. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if you notice, I'm going back into a defensive position. The next cut from here is back down on top of the head, but it's not a full follow through. Now you're just hitting the head. That's eight. Recoil again. Eight. Okay? So we'll roll through it one more time. Yeah, not one more time, there's gonna be a few more, but we'll do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now we're in for nine and ten. So you've done eight. And you're bringing it back. Remember, it's a flow. You cut and you flow back. Nine, ten. Okay? Nine, ten. And we'll go again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now we have the last two strikes. So from 10, we're back again, 11. This is a cut for the clavicle, boom. So you're cutting in this area here. Okay, 11. And if you notice the position of my shield, it's guarding my shoulder. And then you come 12, you come under your arm and back down again, and you're in this wrestling position, which is another guard position. So the whole journey is a journey from this guard position to this guard position. And that is through the 12 cuts. So let's do it all together. We'll do it slowly, and then I'll show you how we look a little bit faster. Here we go. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12. All right? So, let's go through this, and I'll show you how it would look at full speed. Try that again. Here we go. And that is threading the needle. So let's see, we got a little bit more time. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, some techniques that you can use uh, defensively. So um, you see a lot in treatises like I-33 or 133 or L-33, whatever it's called, no disrespect, I honestly don't know what the proper way to call it is. Um, you see a lot of the sword and buckler coming together. Now this is absolutely a thing that you see done in North Africa. Um, you see this a lot with Arab swordsmanship. If you see uh, Yemeni sword and buckler games or Omani sword and buckler games, uh, you'll see they do this a lot. So this is definitely a thing. Um, in terms of how you would use it uh, overall, this actually can impede the direction of the saber. I found personally that it does. Um, so. You know, you definitely want to use them separately, but you can put them together. So if you are applying a technique, for example, if there was a cut coming from here, and you want to catch it, and you want to bind it with a shield, you can protect your hand and cut. 
if you are expecting a cut to your hand, you can cover up in this way as a defense. You're defending. Now, instead of having the defense from the blade to the tip, so from your, uh, so I guess from your chest to your knee, now you've raised, you've added it up to your shoulder, and you're able to up to your raised elbow. So you can add a little bit of distance, or a little bit more cover to you. Uh, so you can definitely apply the sword and shield together, uh, but also be careful because again, if you remember, if your hands are fully extended, you are vulnerable to the upward cut. Some people also refer to the lahia as the Turkish cut, which is basically bringing the blade towards yourself. So that is uh, another example of the ways that you can use the sword and shield. Um, that pretty much concludes what I was planning to teach for today. So I will open the floor now to any questions that anybody might have. Just grab a seat here. So. We have open four. Now, I am uh, sharing with you what I have learned. Um, so if there is something that I don't know, I will let you know that I don't know it, but I will research it and uh, come back with answers later. So, uh, do we have any questions about today's class? Um, swords, shields, how they were used, uh, when they were used, um, or anything along those lines? Um, let me see if I have some interesting historical anecdotes uh, while I'm at it. Um, oh, well, in terms of uh, videos, oh, I do see somebody actually mentioned the Ayar. So yes, the Ayar is another shield type uh, that was used in the Sahara um, and in the southern part of North Africa. So this is mostly a Tuareg weapon. You don't see other Amazir groups um, use it. But you also don't really see it used in Egypt. It is definitely a, uh, a Tuareg weapon, or a Tuareg shield, I should say. Um, some of the videos of the sword choreography that you see in uh, in countries like Mali or southern Libya or you know, southern Algeria, all of the places where the Tuaregs travel, uh, they have some really beautiful um, choreography where you can actually see the use of the ayar and the tacoba together. Uh, any particular why reason why the drill was called threading the needle? I honestly do not know. Um, people have different names for different exercises. Um, I imagine they called it threading the needle because it can be difficult, I suppose, but uh, the challenge with translating texts from the Middle Ages to now, especially when it's translated in an unrelated language, is that certain things don't translate very well. So there may have been a connotation in uh, Middle in medieval Egypt that threading the needle would have been associated with that just doesn't exist in the English language. Are there any books or manuals you can learn this art from? So uh, there are some books out there that you can learn from. Um, if you are interested in more Moorish style swordsmanship, uh, there is Ben Huidel's translation um, that, uh, that is available in uh, French and Spanish. Um, so that is definitely uh, available there. I think somebody was working on an English version of it, but uh, that is one that you can look at. Um, we are currently working on a text that does include exercises similar to this. Uh, so far we've gotten through the lance work, but there is still much to do. Um, so that is available there. Um, you can also look to El Matreg. El Matreg is definitely a, uh, a style that you can use as a template or a base uh, because the what we use for the same basic 14 strikes so the 12 cuts and the two thrusts uh, are pulled straight from there um, so somebody was asking about the swords and shield were they equivalent to the weight of the European counterparts since that's what they mostly got to train with beefy chopping blades to deal with light armor or thin blades um, you know what swords in general weigh about the same I mean, you're expecting a sword that's roughly about, you're expecting a sword that's roughly about three pounds, ish. Um, some got a little bit heavier, but they wouldn't ex exceed much of that, especially since most of these swords were designed to be used single-handed. Um, in terms of the shield, the shields that would have been similar to their European counterparts, yes. Um, so shields like the kite shield uh, definitely would have. Uh, shields like the, but leather shields generally are lighter than shields made of steel and wood. Um, they're made to be lighter. Um, shields like the Calcan were lighter because they were made of wicker. Uh, so uh, they do have, in many cases, lighter shields, but they also have shields that are comparable in weight. Um, so they, they do make sort of the compromise between 
uh, the weight and the and the ability to move to manipulate it. Um, somebody was asking about uh, lahia. Yes. So the lahia is spelled uh, well in English at least. It's a it's l a h i y a lahia or lahia. Um, simply an underhand view of the Turkish court mentioned in some European sources, which I understand. Um, yeah, it, so the, the uh, lahia is meant to attack the arm and attack the legs. So uh, you're aiming, it is a, let me just get up here, it is a low cut. So you are, you know, you are aiming to catch someone down here. Um, you're also looking to catch the arms. Uh, so in the 14 strikes, you'll see that there are. So there are two, there are three kinds of lachia that you'll get in an African saber. You have these ones that aim for the arms, and you have this one that that, go, that is aiming for basically from the navel to the neck, looking to draw the blade up under there. And it's important to note that a lot of the shields were open faced, so the chin would be a vulnerable target. But it would be difficult to catch the chin from these directions, but you definitely could catch it from underneath. Uh, sitting down. Uh, oh, that's great. Yes, Witkin Howard does have it. Uh, so, yes, uh, Witkin Howard would uh, would have that on hand. So, let's see. What is the difference between the length between the Dakoba and the Sword of the Prophet? And how close in size is the Prophet Sword to the Medieval European Longsword? So, the Medieval European Longsword came many years after the Sword of the Prophet. The Longsword was designed to be a two-handed sword. Um, that is roughly about four feet in length. Um, generally, you're looking at the Sword of the Prophet would basically be about this big. Um, and you have to remember that the closest example or the most, the, the closest relationship you would have or, or most similar sword you should have, I'm trying to chipping on my words here, uh, would be the, uh, like the Roman Spatha. So um, it would essentially be something, something along these lines, about, say, three, three feet-ish. Um, there are actual dimensions that you can get, and I will find it for you uh, if I can uh, remember to look it up. But they do have actual dimensions of the swords that would have been carried. Uh, for example, for swords like the Sword of the Prophet. But it would definitely be shorter than the medieval European longsword because it is meant to be a single-handed sword uh, that uh, was more of a... Well, I mean, it was a cut-and-thrust blade, but cutting was more the, uh, was the uh, goal, I should say. Let's see. A four foot blade with a four foot hip. So four foot, it, the long sword I believe would be four foot, including the blade and the hilt. Um, I am not an expert on Hema, so I wouldn't want to speak on things that I am not an expert on. But uh, it is definitely a much longer blade. I have handled them. I have taken a couple of long sword classes. It is a significantly longer blade than you would uh, than you would see. Uh, being used in, uh, that you would see as the, in the early Islamic armies. Let's see, do you have any other questions? Well, yes, the hilting obviously is different in the Sword of the Prophet because they wouldn't have they wouldn't have the uh, they wouldn't have the hand guards here because it would be similar to a spatha, but it's also a shorter blade. It, it's just a shorter sword. Well, uh, Justin, man, you are amazing, Justin. You're grabbing all the links. Thank you for that. Uh, for getting the details on that. Let's see. So, uh, do we have any other questions about the techniques, about sources? Um, any questions about the sword or shield types, uh, armor types, anything along those lines? Uh, okay, what is the curve? What is the backward curve? Okay, so if you're looking for a curve like this, this is so. What I my hypothesis um, is that rever re curves like this are idealized for fighting on horseback, but they're also ideal for uh, for a very fast-paced style of fighting. So if you're on a horseback, if you're so if you're on horseback, you can, oh, you can't even see me here. And I'm exposing myself as uh, not the most adept equestrian, but generally you're looking to pass. So, you know, you're cutting down here. You're trying not to get your blade caught 
you're trying not to get your blade caught on uh, on your opponent. So this is this is also easier on the wrist because you can just let the blade do its work. On foot, uh, a curve like this allows you to come in closer. It's definitely great for uh, fighting in close. It's also good for angles because you can get a very powerful thrust just by turning your hips. So uh, it does add a lot. Um, it also creates a sort of a, a curved roof over your head for protection. And I'll show you a different, I'll show you the difference with a straighter sword. So I have a more heavily curved shamshu here. So you see if I'm holding it over my head, it covers from my ear all the way up to my hand here. If I take a Tacoba and I hold it, which is not too different in, in, in overall sword length, but I hold it in the same position, all of this area is open. So you can see the difference in terms of how it protects my head. This one here adds a little bit more protection on this side here. This one leaves quite a bit of area open. Um, also with the single sided edge here, you also get a bit more, you can add some leverage to it when you're pushing to cut or when you're half sewing. So that's what uh, that's what that will that's what that would add. So um, it does give it less reach. I mean, you could have, for example, you know, this might be, you know, three and a half feet of blade, but you actually only get maybe three and three quarter feet of actual space that you can use to cut it. How far back was the Sword of the Prophet originated? And any idea when she started using the blade before the Mamluks? So the Sword of the Prophet is uh, named for the pro for the Muslim Prophet Muhammad. Um, when his armies would were you know doing their thing in the seventh century, uh, they would be carrying swords similar to that. Um, that was the idea. The Sword of the Prophet was to mimic the sword that was carried by the early Islamic armies in the seventh century. These were heavily inspired by two groups: the Sassanid Persians and the Byzantine Romans. So uh, the Sassanids and the Byzantines were sort of the two big military powers and most, shall we say, smaller or less powerful countries around them would generally um, be influenced by the weapons that they carried. So that would be the, uh, so that would be sort of the, uh, the, the, where the Sword of the Prophet or the idea of the Sword of the Prophet came. So the Sword of the Prophet was being used prior to the Mamluks even being created as a military unit. Let's see. So, uh, do we have any other questions at all about uh, the weapons, the training, um, the types of armor that were used, um, anything along those lines? Um, I should probably note as well that the sword was a secondary weapon. It was not the primary weapon. This was not the first thing they would pull out going to battle. Um, Mamluks would carry, uh, if we're talking about Mamluks specifically, uh, they would carry a variety of other weapons. So they would have, for example, the bow that they may use first if their job was as uh, you know, light cavalry or if they were uh, harassing the enemy or if they were generally just applying arrows to the front line of the, of the enemies. You see that um, in a lot, of the, a lot of the works, especially um, arrows on horseback or bulls on horseback um, the next weapon that they would be carrying would be the lance so the lance would be another weapon they would carry um, and there is extensive information that we do have in english on how they were used um, you know they have uh, and the great part about it the style that the mamluks fought in is that the exercises would definitely be uh, would be easily transferable from horseback to fighting on foot um, so you may read something that is specified for fighting on horseback, but it is very easy to apply it to fighting on foot, and you can also apply a similar principle from that particular technique to uh, using another, to using a different weapon medium. Um, in terms of the uh, weapon, or the shield mediums, generally hide and wicker were the, uh, were the, were the mediums of choice. Um, you have ibex hide, uh, you know, buffalo hide, um, in East Africa, you find more rhino hide. Um, in Southern Egypt, you might see some rhino hide, but generally hide and um, 
sometimes steel, so hide, steel, um, and you do see some stuff made of wood, but generally, if you're talking about the most common um, thing to use to make a shield, we're looking at animal hide and we're looking at liquor. Right, so that is essentially how that, uh, how that works. Uh, so any other questions on uh, the weapons, the shields? Let's see. Was a turtle shell shield common in Africa? Not to my knowledge. As far as I know, uh, they did not use turtle shell. Um, turtle shell was, uh, not a, was not a tool that they used. Um, was the lance only used as a pole arm or was it ever used as a projectile? So it is unlikely that lances were used as a projectile, and this is because they are very long and very heavy, and they're specifically made to be carried on horseback and used to strike down other weapons. Uh, they do have spear projectiles that they would have used, specifically javelins. Um, one of my favorite examples is a short spear called the jarid. So the jarid would have been carried on the saddle. It would have been about the length of the sword, and... Um, in North Africa, they used, it was made completely in iron, but if you go to areas like Russia or the or Central Asia or even Persia, um, you will see that they're made with, uh, they'd be made with light wood, very light wood with a metal tip. Um, the ones in North Africa, you could pull them out of your saddle and throw them. Uh, as I said, they carried them, I believe, in packs of three, and then sometimes they would be hilted with the sword. Um, so that's how that would be uh, that would be used. Uh, spears on foot, it would depend on the spear. I mean, I can't say you can never throw a spear because you absolutely can, but certain spears and lances and javelins are designed for very specific purposes. Lances are specifically designed for keeping your opponent um, at bay or at a distance and taking them out from from far, you can also use it defensively to bat down uh, other weapons. Uh, spears, generally on foot, they can be thrown if they're a lighter spear. I mean, heavier spears can be thrown too, but why? Um, you also have uh, javelins, which are specifically for throwing. So you could carry three, four, you know, maybe five of them, depending on how big your hands are, um, and you'd be able to throw them from foot or throw them from horseback. Uh, the short the spelling of the short javelin. It is J A R E E D, Jarid. Um, some people also spell it J A R I D. So it depends uh, because it is not an English word. So there are multiple spellings of it. Um, so yes, the lance was not used as a projectile. I wouldn't recommend it, especially since the lances sometimes were upwards of seven feet. And, uh, you know, in my personal view, at least in my experience, the ideal length for a spear that is for throwing um, would probably be under, would be under five feet if you want to get the best distance and accuracy out of it. But again, I, you know, am not the king of spears. There may be somebody who has a different view of it and I would obviously be uh, welcome to learn from them. Um, so let's see, do we have any other questions on uh, the weapons, on the, uh, on any of the other kit that the Mamluks may have carried? Um, I should probably mention that the general idea with, uh, for Mamluks is they were supposed to be skilled in North Africa, if we're talking about elite soldiers, uh, should be skilled with an array of weapons. So they wouldn't just be using swords and they wouldn't just be using spears um, or bows and arrows, but they would uh, learn everything from knife fighting, fighting with the battle axe, fighting with the mace. Um, they would learn all different kinds of weapons. And the beauty of the particular style in North African fighting is that they function on a set of fairly basic principles that can be applied to various different weapons. You can use the same 12 strikes or modified for a sword that you would use for a mace. The targets are still the same. If you hit somebody in the knee with a mace, or you hit them in the knee with a sword, it's going to hurt. If you hit them in the forearm or the elbow with a uh, with the mace or the sword, it's going to hurt. If you hit them in the head with the mace, it is definitely going to hurt. And same with a sword, um, just with different impact. So the weapons of the regular soldier were the bow, shield, lance, javelin, and sword. So not a regular soldier. A regular soldier would generally be given, and this is pretty universal across most groups of people, your average common from his farm soldier, or even if he was a basic, or even if he was a professional, 
uh, would generally be specialized. So you would get a spear and a sword and a shield, or you would just get a sword and a shield, or you would just you would not be given the full array of weapons. If you were in if you were an elite, highly trained Mamluk knight. You would then be using the bow, the shield, the lance, the javelin, the sword. You would have access to all of these weapons, and you would carry uh, multiples of them, or different versions of them, or different combinations of them, I should say. You would be carrying different combinations of them with you on the battlefield. Uh, so that's important to note, that there is a distinction between an elite knight or a slave soldier and your common slave soldier or, or levy or volunteer. It's similar to what you would see in Europe or in Japan. You know, in Japan, you have your samurai who are equipped with all kinds of weapons that they carry to the field. They carry the bow, they'll carry a yari, they, you know, they'll carry a naginata, they'll carry a katana, they'll carry a wakasashi. They'll carry all of these weapons together or some combination of them, depending on that person's preference. And uh, that's what they would carry. But your average soldier might just get one weapon. Or he might get two if he's lucky. Maybe he'll get a sword and maybe he'll get a, a knife. Or maybe he won't get a sword because swords are expensive and he'll just get a club or an axe or a spear. So common soldiers would not be as well decked out as their elite counterparts. Uh, as Justin is saying right here, they are special forces. It's a lot of money and time and energy was put into raising, training, feeding, and uh, preparing them to be killing machines, basically. Let's see, so uh, do we have any other questions at all? Just if we have any, anything else to say, we got about three more minutes to go. So uh, I, you know, but uh, I guess I'll take these last few minutes to uh, plug that we do have more classes coming. So uh, this Saturday at uh, noon central time, Damon Stith will be starting his diaspora classes and about two weeks after that so uh, after Damon's last class uh, council member Henry Monzetto will be teaching uh, some uh, his particular styles that he has studied in so uh, stay tuned for those uh, the promotional material for his classes will be coming out soon uh, so we'll be uh, more than happy to share that with you so there will be at least another eight weeks of live classes uh, this is my last run for uh, my section of live classes but uh, definitely they will be continuing on for the next little while uh, let's see with people trying to aim at the cavalier to gather the opponents of the horse and battle is hitting the opponent's horses as much as a valid target um it was battle you did whatever you had to do to take that person down or out um, obviously, if you want to take the horses, you can and you should because they're expensive and losing them in battle is not a great idea. You need to replace them. Um, but also remember that people did train their horses to fight. Um, horses were trained to kick. They were trained to bite. Um, they were trained to run around and uh, you know, support the man that is riding on them. So if you, you know, wanted to take the horse and you could take the horse, you take the horse. If you can't take the horse, you either let it go or you kill it. Um, that really depended on what the needs in that particular uh, situation were. But yes, horses were expensive. It was basically like owning a Ferrari back then, especially if it was... A, and, and we're talking about North Africa. North Africa has a horse culture going all the way back to, the, to Carthage. Um, and, you know, and the Numidians and the, and the, and the Morris people. So they definitely, uh, absolutely loved and cared for their horses. Um, in some of the books, they uh, talk about how you should ride your horse or drive your horse. For example, uh, you do not want, they did not advocate using spurs on your horse. Spurs, uh, especially the ones worn in North Africa, were not similar to the ones you see, um, like the cowboys wear that has the wheel. They were literal spikes, just straight iron spikes. And those were used to push the horse in a situation where the horse is frozen and won't move. Um, you're supposed to drive the horse with your heels, you gotta take care of it. Uh, there are books on the lineage of horses going back, a, you know, centuries. Uh, I wanna say a thousand years, but I also don't wanna paint myself into a corner if there isn't one that goes a thousand years, but I do know for certain that there are books that follow the lineage of horses that go back centuries to prove the lineage and the value of that particular horse. Um, you know, so, so the horse culture is important. 
uh, the kind of protection that horses would have. Um, you actually see great examples, especially during the Ottoman Mamluks. Uh, they're very easy to find. You can find them on Pinterest. You can look at some uh, images from museums. But horses did have up to chain mail that would be used to cover them and protect their eyes, um, protect their necks, uh, protect their flanks and, uh, and their upper legs. Uh, so horses would definitely have that protection. Some horses were padded, had padded armor. Uh, you see that a lot in West Africa, especially uh, among the, uh, the Bornu. Uh, the Kenem Bornu Empire did have uh, padded armor for their horses, and some horses didn't have any. It really depended on the social class of the man riding the horse and what materials were available to him. If you were an elite soldier, you would get the best types of armor available in your day for your horse. If you were not an elite soldier, if you could afford it, great. If you could not afford it, your horse is not going to have any armor, so it depends. Let's see, so it is now 8.30, so that concludes this class. I just want to thank everybody who has uh, chosen to participate, um, people who are watching afterwards, people who continue to support Hama and all of the work that we do. Um, I very much appreciate you guys. I love you guys. Uh, thank you very much for letting us share this little piece of Africa and the things that we love uh, with you. Uh, you know, we don't claim to be experts on any of this stuff. Uh, we are all learning alongside with you, and we're just sharing everything that we have learned uh, so that uh, you can take what information we have, find something new, and teach us something. So thank you very much, and uh, Damon Stith will be taking over from here on out. Uh, just remember, Saturdays, noon, Central Time, that's 1 p.m. Eastern Standard, and uh, we look forward to seeing you. So thank you all, and I will be back later to answer some of these questions and to touch on some of the points that I made. Um, I still have to do that for last week's video. I've been a bit busy. But thank you all, and have a wonderful weekend.